Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we are taking a look at the final perfected version of the Moss semi-automatic rifle. This is the Moss 49-56, and this would be the standard uh, infantry rifle for the French military from 1956 all the way until 1979 with the adoption of the FAMAS. Now, as we've been doing for the last couple of weeks, this is being published in conjunction with the Kickstarter pre-sale launch of my book on this subject, which is Chaspo to FAMAS French Military Rifles 2018-66 uh, to 2016. If you're interested in French rifles, or small arms development in general, definitely check that out. Order yourself a copy today. There's lots of uh, cool Kickstarter-only bonuses and discounts available, so check the description text for a link over there. And without further uh, ado, further commercialization, let's go ahead and dig into this particular rifle. Now this of course was developed from the Moss 49, which was developed from the Moss 44, which was developed from the Moss 40, which was originally uh, conceptualized by the French military all the way back in 1921, right after the end of the First World War. So this rifle is a long time coming and a long time in development. And I point that out because successful rifles are often the ones that have had several decades of iteration to really work out all of the problems and all the manufacturing quirks and figure out exactly how to get the rifle really working right. And this is an example of a rifle that went through that whole process, although I think it's a pretty underrated one today. So um, the main difference, well there are kind of two main differences between this and the Model 49. And well they're all kind of from here forward. So they shortened the barrel, they realized that the Moss 49 had really a longer barrel than it needed. Uh, this is modern combat, like we've got guys in helicopters and vehicles and a shorter rifle really helps and that extra barrel length doesn't actually contribute all that much of importance in terms of ballistics. So cut the barrel down, and while we're at it we'll cut the stock down too, because really do you need a handguard way out here? I'm not grabbing the rifle out there, we can save some weight by cutting that off as well. And so they did that. Um, around this time period, and this is the early to mid 1950s that they were developing this, um, in fact, the, the Moss 49 didn't actually go into production until 1951, and it was only in production for a few years. They had prototypes of this available or finished in 1954, uh, and they adopted it in May of 1956. So around this time they're also changing the style of rifle grenade that they use, from this small diameter one that was used on uh, the Moss 36 LG48 grenade launchers and the Moss 49s, to a NATO standard 22mm uh, diameter grenade, or 22 millimeter internal diameter grenade. So they have to change up the grenade launching hardware on the rifles to accommodate that new grenade, and this is how they did it. So we'll take a closer look at the hardware out here, but when they made that change they also went ahead and implemented a gas cutoff into the rifle. One of the shortcomings of the Moss 49 was that while it was set up to launch rifle grenades it didn't have a cutoff, which means when you fired a rifle grenade the bolt came slamming back in the action a lot faster than it was really designed to. And they realized after a short period that you know, this was going to have negative effects on the rifles over time. And so in fact some of the manuals for the Moss 49 will actually specifically warn you against using them to launch rifle grenades. And on some of the rifles they actually removed the grenade launching hardware entirely. So by adding a gas cutoff what they're doing is preventing the launching of a rifle grenade from actually cycling the action, and that saves a tremendous amount of wear and tear on the gun itself. So that was probably the most significant mechanical change in the Moss 49-56. The Moss 49-56 continues this intention uh, from the Moss 49 of being a universal sort of infantry rifle, wherein it can be equipped with a scope for use as a sniper or designated marksman's rifle, as well as being able to be used as a grenadier's rifle or as just a rifle. Uh, so we have the, the common pattern, the later pattern of scope mount here, which is uh, kind of pushed forward to give you a little bit more eye relief on the scope. This is the same standard APX L806 telescope. That APX, by the way, stands for Atelier du Puteau, uh, or Puteau Workshops. Uh, Puteau starting with a P and ending with an X in French. Um, scopes were manufactured by three different companies um, and all serialized. It's a 3.85 power scope, uh, and it is basically a copy of, or at least a functional copy of the German ZF4. I'll go ahead and pull this off for the moment, just pop that lever, and then this slides off. It does retain zero when you do that, which is pretty cool. 
The development of the rear sight on these rifles is kind of funny, because it sort of bounces back and forth. The original MOS 44 had no adjustment whatsoever. If you wanted to change the zero, you changed the rear, uh, the whole rear leaf to have a leaf with a different uh, location aperture in it. Then with the MOS 49 they went quite a ways in the other direction, and they added screw adjustments for windage and elevation. And then when they came back to the MOS 4956, they decided that that was a little more adjustment than they really needed, and it was extra complexity and fragility in the site that they didn't want, and so they reduced it to just a windage elevation. So your elevation is adjusted simply through your, your BDC here for a range from 200 out to 1200 meters, and then you do have a screw adjustable uh, windage there. These still have the same 10 round magazine of every other rifle in this family, and it still has this external clip, which if you didn't watch the video on the MOS 44 uh, you wouldn't know that this comes from an original design of the rifle as ha with having a, uh, a fixed magazine and five round stripper clip feed. In fact, something that I haven't mentioned that I should is that all of these rifles can be fed by stripper clip. So when the magazine's empty the bolt does lock open, and you have a stripper clip guide built into the bolt face there, so you can load a pair of five round stripper clips, hence the thumb relief right here for stripping rounds uh, into the magazine. Moving up to the front end of the rifle, of course the stock has been cut down as I mentioned. The gas port was actually moved forward a couple inches uh, from where it was located on the MOS 49. That increased the dwell time and made the gun a little bit more reliable. And then they also added a bunch of this hardware. So let's take a look at how that works. This is your rear sight for using rifle grenades, and you line this up with the tip of the grenade to aim it. And you'll notice that you can't lift this up to use it as long as this is down, which is convenient because that is the gas cutoff. So when this is lifted up, the, well, the gas is cut off and the rifle now operates as a single shot manually operated uh, gun. That means that when you fire a rifle grenade you're not putting all this force on the operating system. So once the gas is cut off, then you can lift up the rear sight, and that can go into one of two different positions, either there or all the way elevated like that. Uh, which position you use depends on whether you're going to be firing direct fire, uh, typically anti-tank grenades, or indirect fire, typically anti-personnel grenades. So for, for some of your grenades you will choose which one of these notches, typically one of these three, 50, 75, or 100 yards. Or if you're firing indirect fire, what you would do is use this adjustable ring to determine the range of the grenade. So. The position of this ring determines how far uh, the, the grenade actually sits on the barrel, which determines how long it's being propelled by the charge in, uh, well, in the barrel from the blank cartridge when you fire. And so what we have here are range designations from 90 meters all the way out here, all the way back to 1900 or 190 meters all the way at the rear. And that's what this movable adjustable ring is for. I'm sure some of you noticed this thing on the buttstock of the rifle. This is an added recoil pad, and there are actually two different thicknesses of this that were made, and this is specifically for firing direct fire rifle grenades. However, it does do double duty as an extension to the length of pull of the rifle. So I can slide this off, there we go, this is just solid rubber, um, a little honeycomb in there to give it some squishiness, they're all marked. Well, the Mark Moss 1962. Uh, this is the long one, there is also a shorter one. And this rifle has a pretty darn short length of pull, and that was done deliberately uh, in part to strengthen the stock for the firing of rifle grenades. They did the same thing with the Moss 36 bolt action rifles. Um, but one of the consequences of this, while it works okay for the, the aperture sights, which by the way are pretty darn good aperture sights, um, you have a very very little eye relief for using a scope. And that's part of the reason that they had to tweak the scope mount to kick the scope forward, as you can see here. But it also means that it really helps if you can extend the length of pull by throwing an extra uh, recoil pad onto the butt of the rifle. So this is for grenades, and also makes it a lot more comfortable to use with that optical sight. Take a quick look at the markings here, uh, pretty much the same pattern as on previous models. It's Moss model 1949-56, caliber is 7.5, and it's a little hard to see, but we have a square here 
that's marked with a two-digit year, uh, and this indicates that the rifle was refurbished by uh, one of the French depots. So that's uh, 80, I believe. Um, some of these, whenever a rifle went through that depot servicing, it would be stamped. Um, this is why a lot of these rifles are in brand new shape, basically, is they were arsenal refurbished, then put into storage, and then sold as surplus to the United States. So um, some won't have this, although it's relatively uncommon to find them without being refurbed. Some will have two or potentially even three refurb stamps. If you have a rifle that was you know, used extensively in training, it may have needed refurbishing several times. The serial number on here is going to be printed vertically on the front of the receiver. On earlier models they printed them down here, but uh, for the 4956 it's right there. They actually started these in the G prefix block, so normally a Saint-Étienne rifle would start in F, but they decided that since they had started the MOS 49 in the F block they would move to the G block for the 4956. So they made, well, they made a bunch, you'll find G uh, and H prefix serial numbers. And they did also mark that serial number on the back of the receiver top cover there. As far as the mechanical internals go, while the parts aren't strictly uh, interchangeable, nothing has changed uh, fundamentally from the very beginning, from the MOS 44s. So um, direct gas impingement, tilting block, or uh, tilting bolt. Uh, if you're interested in exactly what the internals look like, uh, go ahead and take a look at my MOS 44 video. I pulled one all the way apart there to show you all of that. Production of these rifles began in 1957. Uh, there would be a total of 175 or 180,000 of them made, and they would serve as France's standard infantry rifle all the way up until the adoption of the FAMAS in 1979. And of course they would serve in a second echelon use for many years after that as well, while the FAMAS rifle was being built up in quantity and distributed to, to army units. So. Um, when they were declared fully obsolete, a lot of them were surplused, and a lot of them were actually sold into the United States. And so it's actually far easier to get them here in the US today than it is to find them anywhere else in the world, which is unfortunate for you guys in France, it's theoretically your rifle, but uh, they're all over here and it's really a pretty cool situation for us in the United States. Uh, however, there is one element um, as a result of this that I want to touch on, because these are Compared to like compared to any other Cold War era battle rifle, uh, you know, primary 30 caliber infantry rifle, these things are a fantastic bargain. They go for a fraction of the cost of say a FAL or a G3. If you think about uh, the scarcity and the collectability of FALs and G3s that are actually authentic military production rifles, not rebuilds on parts kits with civilian receivers. Those things are incredibly expensive compared to something like this. Now in large part that's because these rifles were always only semi-automatic, which means we don't have any sort of machine gun issues to deal with legally uh, with them. But it's also because they're just kind of generally uh, underappreciated rifles here in the US. Now um, like I was saying, because of this there is a safety issue that I want to cover. I mentioned this on the MOS 49 video, but I want to do it here as well because it's important, and that is slam fires and the firing pin in the 4956. Uh, French military ammunition was made with primers that are a lot harder than some of our, well than our, particularly the Pervy Partisan PPU um, uh, commercially available 7.5 French ammunition that we can get here today. And with the softer primers in that commercial ammunition, these do absolutely have a tendency to slam fire. Uh, the fire when you close the bolt on a, on a loaded magazine, um, the firing pin will pick up a bunch of energy as it moves forward, and every once in a while it'll have enough energy that it'll pop forward, hit the primer, and fire around when the bolt closes. That's because these rifles were designed without a firing pin spring. With the French ammunition the primers were hard enough that they didn't need it, and this was literally a non-issue for the French military. They got to choose what ammunition they supplied, but it is an issue for us here in the United States commercially today. So um, there are a couple of solutions for this. There are companies out there that make titanium firing pins. Those can have the exact same outer profile as a steel firing pin, but way less, and weigh enough less that they won't have this problem. Uh, there are also There is also a company out there that makes a spring-loaded firing pin that is just a drop-in replacement in a 4956. Doesn't require any modification of the rifle, you can swap back to the original firing pin if you ever want to for authenticity's sake. Um, I highly recommend getting either one of those if you actually want to go out and regularly shoot a MOS 4956, because otherwise you do run the risk of 
double fires and slam fires, and that is absolutely a potential safety issue. So be aware of that, and as long as you are, these are a remarkably handy, light, rugged, and dependable Cold War uh, infantry battle rifle. So hopefully you guys enjoyed the video and learned something today. This is of course being filmed in conjunction, as I mentioned at the beginning, with the, uh, the pre-sale of my own book on French military rifles. See a picture of the cover right there, and if you take a look down in the description you'll find a link over to Kickstarter where you can uh, browse through the several different options we have. We have a standard book, we have a signed book, ooh, cool, and we have a limited production collector's version of the book in a really awesome clamshell cover with gold and extravagant details, and it's super cool looking. So uh, head over there, check out all of those different options, see if one of those books is something that you think you'd like to have to go along with your 4956 or any other French rifle you have or would like to have. And um, thanks for watching.